All right, uh, like um, it's it's pretty similar. I think you, most of you have uh, worked with the version before, right? So I think it's like the, the basic idea is very similar. Like you you have two visuals running at the same time, but uh, you can also pause these so it doesn't eat up that much of your GPU, just one is running. And yeah, like the basic idea is that the whole UI goes from sort of like left to right, more or less. So um, you do start here actually with uh, adding, adding tox files. So the idea is really, again, that you have this whole system for live visuals, right? It's not like, I mean, live generative visuals and not just uh, videos, but I also added the option to add videos now. Which is really fun, actually. I also tried this on. Uh, I tried this live actually on on one of, yeah, on a, on a party from of some friends, and uh, it worked super well for like on my machine for like seven or eight hours straight. So um, I'm I'm very glad about that. Cool. But uh, yeah, I think it just needs a lot of a lot of power. Also, like the frame drops now because I'm streaming this, I guess. But usually it runs pretty smoothly at sixty for me. Uh, yeah, so you have like the whole audio thing right now that's not on an engine, as I said, because uh, that that produced some problems. But uh, like I did put both of these, like both of the visuals are always like being added into an engine, right? So at least that takes uh, away some of the CPU heaviness. Um, but it, it doesn't really take any of the GPU because I, the, the way I understand it, you can't really split, right? The GPU, it's not like... GPU has more cores, if I understand that correctly. So, um, so you're still running both on the same GPU. So if your GPU isn't that great, you, even though it's running on engines, you can't do like two 4K videos or anything. But um, anyways, so I got the whole audio thing here. I'm, I'm really happy about the beat detection. I actually improved that and that works super well for me now. So kick, snare, and hats. And um, yeah, you got device and file, and uh, I know we talked a lot about this, Derek, but I I I, I wasn't able to to set up a good set it, set it up in a good way, so you can have more than one channel for now. But that still is the idea for the future to to have more than one channel that you can just so you have one device for for each channel, and then you can yeah use Dante Dante or whatever to to send those channels. Um, yeah. And then you can just import a file here as well. This is uh, like, yeah, it's like a mix of widgets and my custom build stuff and also just uh, the touch designer internal UI stuff. So yeah, it's all of that mixed together. So you can see a lot of widget parts here. So when I'm like, I'm gonna go down with the sound, you're probably not hearing the sound anyways. <laughs> But yeah, so we have kick, snare, and uh, I have. And I can use uh, these, like I can fine tune these values here. So I've got like the, the frequencies. So I can like see wherever the snare or the kick is hitting and then just move to, to there. And then here I got like the last couple of seconds of that um, value that comes out of there. And then I can use this threshold to, to adjust that. So just, just gets out the snare basically. Not sure if that makes sense. Yeah, that's cool. And um, then we also got the spectrum here. So the spectrum, um, like it's it's just like you can't do anything directly with here. You can't like drag it anywhere. You can set it up here, and then in your talks, you can just grab grab that directly. So um, for example, when I'm playing this again, and I'm using this. So this is actually grabbing. Like it, inside of the talks, this is actually using in just an in shot to um, to grab this spectrum that's coming out of here, and then you can just pull, yeah display that as as like use that for instancing, for example. And um, yeah, so that's basically the audio. Also got the main level, of course, and then we have the modifiers here. I unfortunately I don't have a controller uh, here at home right now. But basically, you can, you can technically set up several devices, and then you just have your like you can open the MIDI mapper here, and then you can once you turn the knobs, then they'll they'll appear here, and then you can either drag them manu manually on all the parameters, the visuals, 
or you can go uh, to MIDI mode. That's sort of experimental right now, but if you click on that, it will automatically set like all of the MIDI inputs into the available parameters. So you don't have to like drag off all of them manually, but you, you, they're just automatically mapped <clears throat> like in an order, in the order that it's in here. And um, yeah, you can do the same thing, of course, with like the kick. So I can just drag that on here. I've got these fields. And this is by like Derek, this is what I'm meaning with replicators. So what I got here is, um, I'm just gonna drag it on here. You can see it, right. So could I properly get the kick out of here? Yeah, now you can see this is reacting to the kick. So um, basically what I have here is all the parameters and with the Uber GUI, like they're, they're basically, it's just a list in the end. And then I'm just using a replicator to create all of these fields next to it. Um, so I got two parts here. One is the, the UI itself and then all of these replicated fields next to it and where I can like drag stuff on and then it will correspond to that parameter. The thing is it has to like re-replicate all of the stuff when I'm changing the visuals here because the parameters always like react to the change of the selected visual. So um, yeah, it's not super efficient that way, but it, it works pretty well. It is definitely better than having to drag it onto, for example, here, and then having to select something from here. Also notice the lag when that menu appears. Just mm. Yeah. And of course you can also just change this stuff manually here. And then you have the uh, the deck, so you can switch between the visuals here. You can pause them, you can create a thumbnail. So if you click on this icon, it will automatically create a thumbnail in a folder. And then if you refresh, it will, it will be there, appear here. And you can also reload it as it's, as it's an engine, you sometimes might have to reload it or something if it's not working. Um, so you can do that here, or you can just pause it and then it won't be processed. So if I pause this, for example, you can see, no, no, it doesn't really make a difference, but sometimes it really helps with getting up the frames per second. And then I, then you got these different modes, so we have to play this. So right now we have to play this like with six visuals in here. And we can see with this um, thing on the left here, that we're currently at, at on here on the general vision talks. So if I now click on, um, we're actually, I'm just going to drag this over here so you can like reorder these. You can drag files in here. I can just show you that. Okay. So if I get, if I just use this, I can drag it in here and will appear here and look for the thumbnail and the corresponding name. And uh, then I can just reorder these so I can sort of prepare this for a live show or something, right? So I can just make my playlist of, of talks files of visuals. And then if I click, like uh, I can select an animation length and then I can click on next to playlist. Then it will load that into the talks and then smoothly fade over from that to that one. And also our indicator changes. So we can uh, again, let's press pulse. It will wait for a bit for the talks to load and then smoothly fade over. So that's the playlist part and then the animation is simply going from one to the other, going from left to right. It's not going to pick anything from the list automatically, but I can like just use this and drag it onto here. And now I can like switch that way if you don't want to use the playlist. I can also switch manually, so just use a fader here or use a composite. So I just picked a few comp modes so you can like have both visuals sort of being playing at the same time, being displayed at the same time. And um, yeah, so at the top right here, we have the output. So here we can always see the output that's being sent to the projector. And if I output this here, you can't see this now, but this is now on my second screen, or this could also be the projector. And you can define that here. With the master fader, you can send out to the siphon or the spout or NDI actually sending that right now, which is not necessary. Um, yeah, and then you have the adjustments in FX. So the main adjustments, just, you know, brightness and saturation and stuff. And um, then you have some effects here. I'm not super happy about this right now because they're all like right underneath each other. There's no like space between. So I, I definitely want to change this, the setup here because um, I also want to be able to 
um, reorder the post effects because it really makes a difference if you first do an edge and then a blur or the other way around, right? So um, that that's a feature I want to want to add. For example, I can yeah just post um, turn on the these post effects here, and you can also um, change these post effects with the audio or the media or whatever. So I, or the rhythm, for example, I'm going to come to that in a second. But for example, I've got this toggle finger, so you could, oops, you could like turn this on based on the rhythm down here, like turn it on and off and things like that. And um, yeah, there's a lot of different stuff here. You can just mess around with. And then you got the corner pin just to be able to, um, yeah, if you want to sort of very, very simply projection map this into something, or if your projector isn't yeah, adjusted correctly, then you can use this. And uh, yeah, last but not least, the whole rhythm thing and the modifiers. So OSC, we also got OSC. So you can just click on setup here and just type in your IP and network port and stuff. And then uh, on Windows, you actually have to turn off the firewall, I noticed, that's really important. And also OC, I noticed with some students of mine, it doesn't really work well with Mac and iOS for some reason. Maybe you can, maybe you have some experience with that as well. And um, yeah, you, I mean, I'm using like ZigZim for this. I'm not gonna like use it right now, but it's like, you can use your, your phones, uh, like sensors to to drive stuff in here and then we have the rhythms um so the rhythm is set up down here so you can type in the bpm manually you can tap tempo so usually i'd recommend tapping eight times that works the best and then um then yeah we also can go up here like this and click here to like reset the one and then you can like sync it to the music and use all of these uh, different channels here to drive visuals again. You can also smooth the output. And there's also some, some basic um, animation channels here, just some constant, which where you can change like the speed, the range, because for some, sometimes you want to just animate like a hue of the color, right? So you can like change to 360 and then go, we'll, it'll go through all the hues, like to like for all the whole spectrum basically. And you can, yeah, reset them whatever. And uh, you have three different noises, uh, where again, you can change the range, period, harmonics, and um, yeah, use them on anything here, really. And you also have some very basic settings so far, <laughs> really just width and height of the whole thing, but it's also not really perfectly working on 4K or 720p. So really it's, it's so far it's, it works best on HD, but I, I definitely want to change that. You can also change the font here, so, but there will be more later on for sure. And uh, yeah, one, one last thing here is the presets. So uh, I haven't actually, they're not here yet. They're sort of in the back end, um, and I've, I've tried a lot of different things, but I want them to be really good and also to be able to nicely smoothly fade from one preset to the other and all that kind of stuff. And uh, with the current setup I have, it's really not that easy to set up. So uh, yeah, that, that's one, the highest priority for the next version, I'd say, to get everything smoothly running and to also add presets. So that's really where I'm at right now. And I'll also add some spout, spout, siphon, NDI in. I also have a camera in built already, but it also doesn't work super well yet. Um, but that, that would also be a fun thing. Yeah, I think that's actually it. Amazing. So, <laughs> wow. Shoot your questions if you have any or remarks or whatever. <laughs> Well done, man. This seems like such an improvement from the last one. I'm super, super excited to, to um, try it out. Um, what is, I have a quick uh, question about what you were saying about the toxes yeah. um, and the, the spec party one that you showed, like mm -hmm. that had some audio re reactivity to it. Um, were you saying that if there's a tox that has some custom audio reactivity to it, all you need to do is add a like a chop in to that tox and then if you drop the tox in here then it'll work with like with the this or like i'm i, I didn't quite understand that part 
um, the, the way you can set up talks is, uh, yeah, I, that's a good point, actually, is um, really you just need to make like a, a base, of course, and um, some custom operators. And this time it can be any custom operators, luckily, though uh, it actually works best if it's, if it's just one, right? If it's not like an RGB thing because of the mapping here. Um, but uh, anyways, so you just create a base with custom uh, parameters and then inside that base, you just send an out talk to, to send the visual. Yeah. And then if you want to use the audio spectrum of the currently played song in algorithm, all you need to do inside of uh, your talks file is to, to add an in chop and it'll automatically um, automatic, uh, like uh, send that spectrum from algorithm into the talks and then you can just grab it from there. So usually the way I set it up um, now is that I, I use an in job and then I create like an um, like an audio spectrum that or like some kind of sample data that I type in the second input of the in, uh, in right? So it's oh, wait, like yeah. a defaulting. Multiple chop ins to the talks? No, it's just one chop in. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and, then in, and then inside of it, you process the spectrum. Yeah, like on, on the in, you have the second, um, maybe I can I can just show you that quickly. Sorry. Um, wait, let me have a look. Have a look. So basically here, what I'm doing, um, right, no. Okay, let me let me just explain this from start again with, with the example. So you build this base with uh, parameters, right? And you, you, you can add two in chops. And um, the, it works best. Yeah, actually, it was this the wrong example. The, the, the thing I mean with the in and the second input is the parameters, because um, you want to usually grab the parameters just with a power, right? You can just grab it directly uh, from the parent. The thing is, as it's in engines now, it only works with an in job. So this is what I mean. So you put like an in here to grab the parameters. And in the second input, just to set up your talks, you can add the parameters. So this will be overwritten though. That makes right. sense. Um, and what I mean with audio is really, you just have to add like now, of course in here it doesn't work, but um, <clears throat> you just add an in, like a second in job. And then if that is available, algorithm will automatically set the spectrum in there. That's actually all, all you need to do. And then so, you can just work with that in here. Um, and yeah, it'll now show some errors because there's no, Spectrum available, but yeah. So sorry. So how, if you have mul if you have multiple in chops, like how does it how does algorithm know which one to send the audio spectrum to? Well, your first one should always be uh, parameters. Okay. In gotcha. One. Gotcha. 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 And the second one should always be spectrum, but you can also just leave the second one away, and it's, it'll still work. So. Okay. Yeah, that answers my question. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, but, but basically, it's, I mean, it's really easy to just set it up. I mean, you can just use stuff you've already made probably for the, the version before as well. But there, the main difference to the version before was that I used just a, a, a null at the end. It was called PG, and I was grabbing that. And um, now I'm actually had with engines, you have to just send it out with an out top. So that's the main difference. And uh, the whole thing with the in here as well. So, yeah. It's it's a bit of a weird workflow working with engines, but it's um, it's cool once you do that because you also get more into the the thinking of building 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 blocks instead of components, right? So that's uh, yeah, it's a good work. It's a good but a bit, a bit of a strange workflow first. Yeah, I really want to work with engines just to kind of get a get a sense for that. You want? I can also show you a bit of uh, the inside, or like the back end. If you, it's really pretty. I just got it open. I'm looking at the organization. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I can. Uh, I can just uh, walk you through this very roughly, if you wish. Sure. So, um, yeah, we got like the. It's a lot of levels actually. It's just going deeper and deeper. So we have like the main part here with the footer here. We got the header here. And then here's all the content. And uh, yeah, it's just basically structured the same way as the UI is. So we have the input the parameters selection, like the decks and the output here. And then in each of these, again, we have the, the sub categories. So audio, 
on the modifiers and on audio again we have yeah here i've actually prepared the different ins so like several channels so that's still in there but it's not like um yeah it's not working yet and then in here this used to be an engine but uh it didn't it had a lot of problems with that so i hope i can put this into an engine again and then, that's not uh, active right now sorry it is active but it's not in an engine it's just a normal base so Oh, so it's just the title that says engine. Gotcha. Yeah. And then in here, again, we have all the um, audio analysis happening, kick detection with visualization and stuff. And I'm just grabbing all of that and sending it out. And then I'm uh, displaying that here on, in the UI. So again, for every part we have like, a, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's a lot of levels. And um, yeah, same for all the other stuff. But I think most interesting might be for you to see the visuals here. So um, this is the way I've set up the visuals. Uh, so we have two engines and there's a lot of stuff going in there. So both a parameter dab and parameter chop, a, like the current talks, because actually in this engine, there's another engine <laughs> because uh, the thing was when I loaded uh, the talks into one engine, the other one was slightly lagging for one millisecond or something that triggered me. So I had to like, now there's an engine inside the each engine. And when you load something in an engine that's already an engine, then it doesn't lag. So um, mm. that's the way I kind of, so actually what this engine looks like inside is this. So you can see there's another engine here and some more stuff being piped in here and also out again. So this engine is actually where your talks file will be loaded in. So here, grabbing the path from there. And um, yeah, we have the second engine that's just ex exactly the same. We're, we're like sending out some stuff here to the UI again and displaying the name and everything like that. And uh, here, we, and I just set up the different modes. So we have the playlist mode. It's just some logic, how to cross from like one to the other, same here. And um, yeah, then I'm sending that away to the uh, post effects. So grabbing it somewhere from here again, like grabbing it from, like to the monitor and um, also to the post effects. So I've got like all the adjustments here. So if you have a look here, we have these three different tabs and they're basically three different um, components here. And then inside here, we have all the post effects one after the other with like switches so we can turn them on and off and i've already had like a system where where i could reorder this and i'm always very proud of that but it, like it, it slowed down everything so much for whatever reason i don't understand <laughs> but um yeah so i'm it, it's really a weird weird setup to be able to you know because you can't like just connect them like this so you had to, i had to use like all kinds of select chop, uh, select tops and stuff and a lot of like, I don't know, Python to reorder them. Everything is interesting, <laughs> interesting challenge. And yeah, the part in the parse, I just have the container from the Uber GUI, which is really cool. You just have to like drag it in here, just define the uh, base that you wanna um, grab the parameters from. So in this case, it's, it's one of these. So you got all the custom parameters and then you, they're just being displayed directly in the style here and you can interact with them and stuff. And you can uh, style this uh, quite nicely, which really should be included in the parameters comp that Touch Designer provides. But um, I mean, it's cool that this exists as well. And there's a lot of stuff going on in here that you don't have to understand. Like, I mean, yeah. So I don't know, I think that that, that kind of gives you some kind of idea and yeah <laughs> any more questions do you have any idea of the total latency if if you had like a live someone singing say or an instrument coming in um mm -hmm. to the time the uh, visuals can react like any idea of the total latency yeah that's a that's a very big question with the whole thing like i, I when i was live uh, i think there was something wrong with the interface i'm not sure the the audio that i got into touch was very strange so i can't really say but this this doesn't actually 
um, add a lot of latency. I know this, like it works pretty, pretty fast. So, um, but yeah, I think in the end, it's still the best. Uh, and I think, yeah, Derek, you told me that, like it's still the best to add latency on your audio as well, slide one. So that is being synced. I mean, that's that's always going to be the best way, probably. But um, yeah, like actually, algorithm itself doesn't add a lot of latency. I think the most latency just comes from, um, yeah, getting the audio into touch and uh, yeah, touch internally, and then uh, also sending it again to the projector. Right. So, but I don't know. I I don't have numbers or anything. Like, yeah, it's hard to measure. It's there's tricks you can do sometimes to measure yeah. this stuff. But I think like two to five hundred milliseconds is probably a pretty good ballpark range. Yeah, like that's around what I end up hitting with anything. Um, would you be able to show again? Because I'm having a hard time dragging like the spectrum over onto one of the to modulate one of the parameters. On I the, drag the spectrum onto anything. Okay. Um, well, like the chops like, that are on the side of the kick and snare and everything. Yeah, the the, the spectrum is really only like the, everything you see here is just for setup. So you can just fine tune your spectrum, and that mm -hmm. is being sent to your talks if you're grabbing it there. So oh, okay. that's what I told Nick earlier with the with the second inch up, right? If you add the second inch up to your talks and then reload that into algorithm, then it'll automatically grab that spectrum and. The way that spectrum behaves, like how many samples, like yeah, sam like the sample amount and the FFT size and all that kind of stuff, you can like define here. You can and filter it here, and that is what will be sent to your talks. So the sample size parameter is adjusting like a resample. Yeah. Nice. So you can dial that in precisely. Say you wanted to be like fifty. Yeah, like you can go, like you can, yeah. Wait, no, it's a sample. Yeah, I, um, you can't actually, like, it's not super precise as you don't see the numbers right now, actually. Right. But, um, yeah, this is also... Still... But if it was driving your instancing network, then you could just yeah. kind of adjust the amount of clones. Exactly. That's the idea, at least. And uh, this is actually the frequency in the second side. Like the frequency. Oh, for the filter, for the filter, nice. Um, I've got it open and every, I've, I'm, I don't have any errors. I, I had to re, you know, tell it where the files were and stuff like that. But when I drag a tox on, it's just not auto. I mean, it seems to be working, but I'm not seeing it play. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I'm kind of at a loss as to what I should try. Did you uh, drag in tox files from the examples or did you make uh, your own? No, well, I just opened up, I just opened up the toe or yeah, the toe from the zip. And yeah. so I, I have to actually drop, it, it appears as though the toxins are already loaded in, but do you think yeah, I have yeah, to, you re, have to like, re drop yeah, them in? Clear everything at the bottom right of that part, like above drop in here, there's clear all. So you have to like re-drag them in because what's actually happening there- Ah, uh, got you, got you, got you. You're loading in tox files into that playlist is that it's actually just loading in the, uh, the path for all of the different tox files. So it's not actually loading the tox files. The tox files are only being loaded once you drag them into the engine. Then they're being nice. put into the engine. So if you like drag them into there, it's really just saving all of the like the path, the connections to that file. And I should drop them from the tox folder right into the drop them here. Yeah, exactly. So clear everything first and then drop them back in there and then hopefully it should, should be working. Do I drop it on into the to drop in here <laughs> into the GUI? Yeah, yeah, onto onto the drop in here field. I'm getting a. It's not letting me for some reason. So I can just uh, quickly show you that again. So if you just clear them here, you can open up your your folder. Just use uh, just a simple noise. Drop drag it in here. Actually, it's the. Um, Oops. Yeah, now I uh, reloaded the engine. That always takes a bit. Actually, I wanted to do this and then refresh, and now it's got a proper thumbnail as well. But yeah, just open up, up here and drag it into there. I do that again. Here, open on? Your, your folders, your, your folder in Windows, and then just. See, what is the cursor? 
when you drag it on the drop them here. Yeah, see, I'm not getting that little plus. Oh, really? Okay, that's right. You're getting a, a null, you know, like a circle with a cross, like you can't do this. Do you have it in perform mode? Yeah, that's the idea, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Steve, are you really worked or? Do you I have took, toxins working? Uh, yeah, I got two of them working. I had to have two of them in before it would play anything for some reason. Like I cleared everything out. And so I have like a display zoomer. And let me try loading in like a simple noise one. Yeah, simple noise is working now too. So I have two toxins working. Um, and I am just dragging them to the drop them here thing. Uh, let me try dropping jungle vision now. Yeah, yeah, no, it works. It work works for me. me. Yeah, I was dragging the toxes out of the 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 zipped folder. Oh like pretty yeah, extracted. That happens to me all the time on Windows. I'm like, yep. oh, why doesn't this file work? <laughs> nice. And now, are they being displayed as well? Like, are they being played, played back? If you drag. Loading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got simple noise in here, activated. Dragging in jungle vision. Engine loading. Yeah, I got two toxes working, no errors. Let's go. Awesome. Let's go. That's beautiful. Yeah. The thumbnails are a really nice touch too, William, in terms of like just being able to grab a new thumbnail from the tox itself so you yeah. can like yeah. easily see all of them. Yeah, and they're all pictures on in a folder, so you can also just make your own ones and then put them into the folder. If you just name them the same as the talks as it is here, uh, then it should automatically connect that. Or if you just click refresh, then it should load that. And could you demonstrate how to take something from the music and then apply it to modulate a parameter again? Because I think I'm having a hard time getting that part to work. Do you actually hear the sound? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So uh, yeah, if you yeah you can uh, extract kicks, snare, and hats. So for uh, if they want the kick, for example, now I can see like this is the spectrum from fifty to six hundred. It's not the entire spectrum, right? Because it, you don't need the entire spectrum for a kick. And then you can just then you can see here where the kick is strongest, and then you just drag your slider here to that position where it's like hits the, the hardest. And of course there is no beat now. <laughs> um, so, and then, then you see these two, um, these two graphs here. So the, the lower, like the pink one here might be a different color for you because I actually changed that in the preferences of touch designer. So, um, so the lower one is the, the incoming value or the value that you're getting from here. And like the peaks and with the threshold you can like if you, if you go up with it like too high right now it actually can. by the way you can also change like the input gain here so if it's like too high or too low you can change it uh you can just set that threshold so every time the kick hits it just goes over that threshold and then you're getting out the signal here as a zero to one and then you can just drag it onto any parameter just take it here and just drag it onto it onto these fields next to it, like not on the parameter itself, as you can see, you can drop it there from here. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, there's also another feature I want to add is like you can't adjust like the strength yet. So I'd highly suggest um, normalizing your parameters as well between zero and one just works the best. Just to, to set ranges in here in your talks files that, that work the best for your visual. And same with the snare and the hats, I can just use them and drag them on. And on anything, and then I can smooth them a bit. Wait, sorry, you said you could smooth the you can smooth the signal, like lag it. Here. Uh, oh, I see. I see. I see. Yep. Uh, yep. Gotcha. gotcha. Same uh, here with the rhythm. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. 
And yeah, if you if you want to stop like stop the connection, you can just click on that parameter. Or if you have many uh, open, you can you can disconnect all, and then it'll just yeah. And you also have a reset all. So if you click that, it'll uh, just put everything back to default. So and I also I'd also suggest creating default values when you set up your custom parameters. So every time you reset, it'll come back to that. But that will be irrelevant once you have preset values. But for now, ever. I have another question about about that. Um, like, if you if you were to if you were to uh, attach a MIDI controller to this, um, and then you also attached like the kick signal to the same parameter, like it's only, it's only use, it will override that. You can only use one at the time. Okay, so whatever one you do late, like whatever one you connect latest, would be the over would be the overridden one. Yeah. So if okay. I connect the kick here now. Now it'll be the kick, and if I now take the, this constant, it'll now use that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. So, what William, are if we, you if using we put it, for the? Go ahead. Go ahead. If we put a uh, small MIDI controller in with you know like eight knobs or something, can you connect all eight knobs real time and do multiple things at once? Yeah. Like on the premise. Yeah. yeah, that's the idea. Like you can either drag in every every single channel that you have in here and automatically. Uh, man manually put them on all of these different um, okay. Okay. but you can also just click on mini mode and it'll automatically just set them here. Sweet. I would love to demonstrate that. But I don't know if you can at the moment, but... So it auto maps to your parameters that are loaded. Yeah. Based on the order in the, the okay. learn order in there. So you have to twist it one at a time yeah. and then it'll cascade down your parameters. Is that right? right. And then it, when you load a new tox that has a different number of parameters. Yeah, um, it, it'll um, like, it'll just, if, if you have like 20 channels from the device, like from the media device, and uh, we go into media mode, it'll just like select all of the available ones. Right. And um, okay, yeah, cool. if there's a new tox, then um, yeah, it'll always just grab everything that's possible basically but the way the, the, the way you assign it is like if it's a boolean then this boolean here or or it's just like you might have a button and you have a, a float into the button what do you mean a float into the button like if you have a boolean that is just a button yeah. that you can push and press and and not like have the pressure uh, sensed into it how do you do uh, a float assignment in for not being into a bottom like a boolean mm -hmm. how do you assign can, can you show us a bit inside of the of the file how the assignment is is done from the midi now you mean yeah, for, for the MIDI. It's really like, I can, I think I can just tell you, it's really just, um, uh, it's really basically just a Python expression. It's just like, it's, it's okay. as if you would drag this onto a parameter and just say um, like reference, pass reference something, right? So it, it's, it does the same thing. So it's really, it's, it's really just saying for this, for parameter zero, um, put in this expression once you like there there's this little yeah, I guess I can just show you yeah <laughs> it does make more sense uh, like it, like two different parts I can show you uh, so for the for each so this is what I mean with the replicator so we have like the UI here and then all the all the fields next to it and if I go into here you can see it's based on a replicator based on a table on the of the parameters and if you go into here you have this drop, um, drop Python script. And it's basically just saying, look for the currently selected um, visual. So one or two and uh, grab my parents digits. So which parameter am I basically? And then um, set this expression. So when you drop something, I'm not sure if you've worked with drag and drop of like this drag and drop here. Like not said. in touch. Okay. So basically you can just define here on the parent uh, legacy drop system and then select a, uh, a dat that is responsible, like that's been run once you drop something in. And then you can like print stuff out there, like arguments, uh, like 
the path and stuff. And I'm here, I'm just using the, the path and the name. And I'm just using that and setting that on the on that parameter of the engine, basically. So if you drop something on this field, which is number zero, and uh, it's the kick, then that path of the kick and the name of the kick will be sent to to the first parameter of of the of the engine that, that corresponds to that. So that is that is one part. And the other thing is, uh, if I go to uh, MIDI parts here. Um, so what we have in here is, is just a MIDI in, and uh, there I've got some weird uh, normalization going on here, which isn't perfect yet. I haven't found a perfect way to normalize it because the thing is sometimes what you get in there is a value between zero and one, and sometimes a value between zero and 127, right? So yeah. um, uh, I, I sort of managed to normalize it, but it's not perfect, but it, it does work. So everything is just between zero and one. Uh, sort of automatically it works, but there's some slight, like the thing is once it goes below one, um, mm. it, it's going to very slightly jump. I fixed that with a lag, but it's a bit hacky. Um, so if anybody knows mm. the perfect way to normalize MIDI, then uh, please let me know because uh, yeah, that's quite important, of course. Um, yeah, and then basically I'm just sending out like all the MIDI signals to an OP viewer so you can just grab them directly here and put them on here and then the drop that that the drop script i just told, told you about is being run and just referencing the current meeting channel to the current parameter yeah so at one point i would think maybe if you can understand if the signal you're taking is a button or or a floating point um Maybe you could make like, it's kind of an AI, it's a decision taking um, uh, operator to decide how to assign, you know, those, because if you go just zero, one, two, three, if you assign also another variable that says Boolean or float, you can then by, by taking those parameters as true, you can say, okay, the, these both two, true let's assign this and you assign the first of each of and then for the other what you're trying to do is to get the zero and one like range and the zero and 127 to be zero one yeah so you should divide the one with 127 by 127 right yeah, and and that's one. So you mean zero to, like uh, like for the MIDI one, you go from zero to one hundred and twenty-seven. Yeah. Uh, so you you divide that by one hundred and twenty-seven, and you get from zero to one. Right. But this and, means that that some of the buttons, like with, for example, my uh, I think MIDI mix. One, some of the buttons are between zero and one and some 127, like the sliders. So like the, the thing is not, like the problem is not being able to, uh, it's uh, how to, to normalize it, know. but to detect whether yeah. the range of a knob is between zero and one and zero and 127. They put, uh, for that, a threshold that activates a Boolean that says true. And if it's true, you like, give them a metadata name and like group them yeah Something i am like thinking that. With, like with um with a uh wait yeah with a select actually where there's like there's this basically saying is it above one or not and then it's just yeah. everything that's below one and everything that's above one and then we're like merging them together and ordering them and stuff yeah. And uh, of course, the, the one that follows the first category That's of 127, I remapping to, to yeah, zero and one, and the other one I'm just leaving the way it is. It works, but again, as soon as it like transitions from above one to to below one, it's gonna like slightly jump because it's like a new range. But a limit. A limit. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. 
with the lag, it actually works pretty well. Just a very slight lag, um, which you barely notice when you turn in knobs, but like it, it kind of gets, gets rid of the... But it breaks, like it gives an error? No, 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 it doesn't give an error, but it just, oh, okay. no, it jumps and that can trigger you when, not, when you're programming something like this. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks for what that. What are you using for the um, the smoothing on the the kick snare hat analysis? Lag, just a uh, lag as well. Time sliced, I guess. Obviously, or yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm using the lag at the very end uh, when I've already got like the signal. Out. So I'm not using it on the spectrum or anything. That's right. Uh, like a post lag, basically. Um. Just a just a small point, but but I, I think it might be interesting to put into your backlog to maybe have like like a different knob for the attack smooth versus the like decay smooth. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, that's true because I also noticed um, with the with lag on both like the input and the output. Uh, the problem is that if you use it then on a button, for example, like a pulse, it, it doesn't catch it always. Because it doesn't go to to one, right? If you like lag it, right, uh, yeah. it goes to like point nine and something, and uh, then it doesn't actually trigger the pulse. And sometimes, sometimes it does for some reason. But, um, yeah. So yeah, you're you're right on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm the one thing that I would immediately be craving in is just the ability to do the MIDI and the audio at the same time so mm -hmm. that the MIDI becomes, I mean, the way it works in modular is like, it is you plug a CV in and then the attenuator that, or the knob that did control your, your parameter is actually just an attenuator, you know? So like if you, there might be a, a simple way to do it where you, if you drag a kick on, to the the replicator or to the the parameter connection then the midi acts as just an attenuator for, or, or you know to scale down mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like you could yeah yeah, yeah totally maybe... no that's a really good idea i have you like, like you know, both into a math job or whatever yeah and like the multiply would just i mean it probably scale wouldn't it down, maybe. be that hard you could do that maybe you could even do like another mode or something where you can just add stuff together I mean, it's not really that hard to do because you could just say, just add a Python expression that's just saying, add this. Uh, this plus this, this path yeah. Plus this path. Multiply so, the audio by the MIDI. Yeah, yeah. Or multiply in. Because I mean, it's working immediately for me. I'm drag I'm smoothing out kicks and snares and dragging it to multiple parameters. I got the noise jumping around. The smooth, the smooth works really well, surprisingly. But it's like, it's it's only some parameters really work right because you because you can't scale it you know but it does is working yeah yeah, yeah totally. because i also have normalized some of the operators uh obviously parameters uh of my talks but you mean normalize it to your ideal yeah your ideal range yeah right so like the in algorithm it's always zero and one and then in your talks file it's remapped to your perfect ranges right that's kind of the, the idea so then in the toxes, I'm curious, you're, it's, it's crucial to use a parameter chop to route the custom parameters to the inside, right? Or is, could I use it? Could oh. I bind as well? Like could, it would binding the custom parameters to the noises inside or whatever else be the same as using a parameter chop to select and route them throughout the tox. Like, because we're using an engine, you actually have to use an in chop. Like the parameter chop. To get the parameters it. in. Yeah, like um, yeah, to get the parameters from algorithm because because I you got you and stuff like that in engines. That's so, why you had a parameter chop inside the tox going yeah. into an in. Yeah, okay. but and that's how it gets into input, the engine. Um, it's being overwritten by whatever comes from algorithm. So that, that having the parameter chop inside of your tox is really just for you to set up, to easily set up your tox file, but it's not needed anymore once you use the tox instead of algorithm. That makes sense. Because, because algorithm will automatically pull the custom parameters exactly. from the tox exactly. and like 
okay and like route it to the end so that secondary end gets like gets just cut it's off written, yeah 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 gotcha 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 so if i wanted to try to quickly adapt the talks that i've made in the past to to load into here i just need to change the name of the output if it's simple enough right to the bg or well um is there are a couple steps and an out top you have to use one in in top uh, one in chop for the parameters as just discussed and you can add right a right right for your spectrum and that's kind of all you need to do then just save it with the name you want to save it as that should actually do it i don't need to name the out chop something besides out one it doesn't matter what it, like the only thing is that it sends something out Again, because of the engine, you have to do that way. I'd like to know a little bit more about why it's an engine and what's the difference between like a normal TD project and an engine. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is with engines is that like uh, actually in the to, to go one step back in the first version that I did of this, I actually had like at least for like at least temporarily, I had uh, two or three even uh, different touch designer instances open at the same time. So um, it works better, you know, like uh, it's less heavy, heavy. And uh, I think it's been around for a good year now. Uh, they've, they've added engines. So it's the ability to load in Tox files into the engine. And then that talks file will be run on a different touch designer instance, meaning also on a different core or being spread over the cores, because the way I understand the touch designer usually runs in one core. So um, with engines, you can use several and you can sort of uh, lessen the load on one core of your CPU. So, <clears throat> and also the cool thing is they're, they're basically running independently, at least more or less. I don't know. It's my experience with them has been very mixed, but um basically when i'm now like having these visuals running there and something is lagging inside of there or something is lagging uh, in my ui then it doesn't actually affect the visuals the only problem i have with that is i mean that sounds perfect first but the thing is when once you send the um visuals back into your main system they are again being de de affected by a lag in your ui so that's kind of a problem one one sort of solution I came up with would be to actually have another instance of Fetch Designer open just to grab the visuals and to display them. And that actually also works, but I don't think that's a very sexy solution, right? So I kind of ditched that again. But um, yeah, basically you can have a tox file running independently from your main project and you can send, uh, I think so far, SOPs, uh, not, no, like chops, uh, that's and tops in and out and um, yeah create your components that way and as I said in the very beginning I can I also had the idea to put the all the audio analysis into a talks but for some reason that behaved kind of strangely um, so still have to look into that okay yeah maybe maybe it would be good to have like a window that can function uh, as a separate entity, you know, inside of the engine for for the for the top previous, you know, for them yeah, not to freeze. You can't do like a window comp or anything from an engine. That would be ideal, right? Where you just sort of directly display stuff from the engine to your projector or something, but that's not possible yet. But I think they might change that. I hope they're working on that. And project-wise, like, when you build, I built interfaces and, and 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 those things, you know. But how the engine is managing all the information? What's different to building it into a container, like a normal container, you know? Um, I mean, it it, it really it functions exactly the same way as if you like. I mean, you're you're setting it up in a in a base. And um, <clears throat> as, I, as I showed you as well with the talks file, so it's the same as, as a talks file, you just set it up that way and it just functions exactly the same way. It's just that you can't actually go inside of it in, in your network, but it, and, and it doesn't, like it's not processed on the same core. So it's just opening another touch designer instance, instance, but it's really 
exactly the same thing that's happening behind the you know. Okay. At least that's okay it. because I, I, I'm working with old versions because of projects I'm I'm making. Uh, you get stuck in like certain properties of 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 touch and I haven't tried it, but I'm gonna try it. Yeah. The cool thing is that they also have released touch engine for Unreal, so you can do so like mm. external software generally. Um so you can you can create tox files and everything instead of touch and then directly use them in Unreal for a texture for if you wanna use the key or something. So it's it's a very powerful thing for sure. And I think they're mm. they're gonna push that much more than, than now. Okay, I like that. Yeah, for that, for Unreal, we are we are now like displacing things, you know, in Unreal, and uh, and it's it's much more correct than in Touch Designer, you know. Maybe for three D, you you might want to use other softwares, but for two D and and this kind of stuff, Touch is epic. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I actually I think I also mentioned earlier. Uh, like not today, but at some point, um, is that I mean I I heard from from the deriv derivative that the the DST function is basically done, right? So it's gonna no be, gonna be included as a chop in the next experimental, as far as I know. Oh my God, that's a game. Can, can, can you repeat that? Game? That's a game. <laughs> can you repeat that? Sorry. Oh, what what's gonna be in the next? next? Yes, so synthesizers and all uh, as a chop. I hope I'm nice. I, it's actually okay that I'm saying this, but <laughs> Greg said it in the last meetup. Just yeah. typing everyone. Sorry? Oh, I said Greg said that in the last meetup. Oh, perfect. Okay. I would call that an official announcement. <laughs> just told me that. Uh, okay. Um yeah, cool. But yeah, the, that's gonna be super exciting. And it's basically just the same way MIDI works right now. So you have all these buttons and the VSTs, and once you turn one, it's gonna be shown on the on the chop. And it's yeah, it's gonna be insane. And I really wanna include that in the next version as well. Once it's out, it's gonna oh be God. funny. Nick looks like he's about to explode. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm just like so so the you could connect the parameters of the VST to like like the, you yeah, could yeah. like oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so we're gonna just hopefully have another um, <laughs> year where it just says VSTs and then an audio in there and stuff like that. That's uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, what I need is to be able to split, you know, the algorithm in two windows because it's kind of because I don't want to make smaller the the parameters, you know. What do you mean, make smaller the parameters? Like, because when I see the program functioning, you, you can see here the sound waves, here the visuals. Maybe maybe if you split sound and and visuals, um, yeah, that I have can be a good thing. Yeah, I have the first version as well, well, like the whole UI um, spread over to desktops. But um, I don't know, I, I personally didn't didn't like that. So uh, especially thinking about when I'm going somewhere live that I just have like my laptop and that's yeah yeah. But yeah, the option is, is of course always uh, would always be great to just be able to do that. Um, but I I'm thinking this kind of of software can be used like permanently in some place. You know, someone could like be I don't know buying tox files for running live shows. You know, like yeah. you you can make a tox marketplace yeah that's with these kind awesome. of things one of one of the ideas I'm, I'm having is that with both the modifiers and of course the toxes and then later also post effects that these are all modular at some point so people can just upload their own stuff and then share it and then you can just go to a show and just drag in whatever you need for like yeah post effects and for i mean with tox files it's already possible now right but with modifiers, uh, it's not yet, and post effects, it's also like, still a lot of work here to be done. Um, but that's kind of the idea, uh, like where I'd love to go into. But that's really hard to set up. Um, but it would be so cool to have like a whole library of different modifiers, where I have lead motion and whatever other devices they're they're out there, and then the same with post effects. So yeah, I'd love to sure. to, to be more of a like a community thing as well. Yeah, yeah, I think 
that designer has a community to be able to to get to that place you know yeah, yeah. it's like it's like open gl but but in a different way you know yeah uh, with with less code code involved like um how what's the name of that website uh where you can get um GLSL, you know, lots of GLSL projects that you can get yeah. into. Um, shader toy. Shader toy. Thank you. We can make like a shader toy, but by talks, you know, a talks shader toy place. Yeah, um, like I don't know. Greg should do it, you know, not <laughs> me. <laughs> uh, I mean, for that, I mean, yeah, what I also, what was my priority with this version as well? And um, it's just to have everything running smoothly. So that's really still my focus. And um, I mean, yeah, as, uh, as Steve also has some problems with running at, at low FPS and I also have on my old laptop, um, I'm still not super, super happy with that. And I, I'd like, like this to be very light and I'm hoping that they're also uh, fixed the UI system so it doesn't like eat up half of your processing power. Uh, <laughs> UI right because it kind of does that right now so but they also hinted that they might change that so let's see um but but that still has priority so I don't know when the feature of you know modular stuff will come yeah and if you make nfts of those stocks oh god yeah <laughs> 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 yeah yeah so. Very good. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. 